Well, good morning, Sheridan Hills Baptist Church. It is a truly a joy to be with you this morning, not only because it was 35 degrees in Louisville this morning, although that is one reason. I've only been rubbing it in a little bit with people at home. Uh, but it is a great joy to be with you. As Pastor, Pastor Andrew said, uh, I had the privilege of serving with Lucas on staff for three years at Clifton, six years together, so encouraged by that partnership and, and that relationship. And then we sent uh, Lucas and Indy down here to you. And again, as he said, in return, you've sent some of your own up to us and uh, Tommy and Caitlin and TJ and a little bit like a prisoner swap, although... <laughs> hopefully different in certain ways. Um, I want you to know that Clifton Baptist Church prays for Sheridan Hills Baptist Church. Ever since we sent uh, Lucas here, we have you on a, just a list of churches whenever we gather on Wednesday nights. It's a list that we work through and, and pray regularly. So we are praying uh, for your church and we thank God for your commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ for your commitment to the Word of God, and uh, we consider you all partners in that gospel, and so we rejoice in that. I did have such a good time uh, with the men this weekend. I do want to note I was on the, the old guys team that won the soccer game, so <laughs> I'm feeling proud about that. Um, but most of all, of course, just so thankful to, to walk through Hebrews 12, to think together about this call uh, for us to endure in our faith in the midst of just all variety of, of trial and difficulty that we face in this life. And, and really what I want to do, I, I want to just expand on really similar themes that we've been thinking about all weekend with those men and, and expand that out to you as well. And I want to do that from 1 Peter chapter 1. This has become really one of the most significant, in addition to Hebrews 12, uh, one of the most significant and treasured passages for me personally in terms of my life, in terms of my ministry, for, for how to frame our thinking about the sufferings and the, and the trials of this life. It, it, is, it is truly a gift of God to us, and I hope it will be an encouragement to you. So I'd like to begin by reading these verses. We're going to focus on uh, verses 6 to 9. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start reading at verse 3 just to give us some of the context. So here's the word of the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. For most people, when they face suffering, one of the questions that, that will inevitably arise is why? And, and if in their worldview at all, they, they even have some type of concept of God, it's not long before that question then gets directed towards him. Why would God allow this? Why would God allow this to happen particularly to me? And it, maybe that's a question that has landed heavily upon your own heart and mind at some point in your life. Maybe that's a question that's landing even heavily upon your heart and mind this morning. 
Why would a loving God allow such difficult, painful, burdensome, wearying, grief-filled events and circumstances to enter into our lives? Especially, think about this, especially the lives of those who have entrusted ourselves to him for our care, for our keeping, for our well-being. Tragedy, persecution, sickness, we prayed about that this morning, loss, toil, futility, unmet desires. If we've really been saved by Christ and his promises are true, why do we still suffer? Why, why do we still face such difficult and grief-filled trials? One of the things that I find so compelling about Christianity and, and particularly about the truth of the Scripture is that it does not sidestep the most difficult questions that we face in this life. The, the Bible is a very realistic book. It's not trying to pull the wool over your eyes. God's Word doesn't shy away from dealing with some of the most difficult questions that you and I face. Rather, it, it addresses these things head on. It, it addresses the reality of our experience, and it gives real answers, answers that I think when they are received and trusted are profoundly satisfying. And I think we have a great example of that this morning in 1 Peter. As Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he just wades directly in to the difficulties that, that his hearers are experiencing. And, and he gives then God's own view of the reality of our suffering. And so, so even on the front end here, as we're about to enter into these verses, I think it's right to just pause and consider what a gift this is to us, that God would make known his view of our suffering. And it's the, it's the very nature of suffering, right, that it's disorienting. It, it's confusing. When you know this, if you've been through through severe suffering, it, it can feel like you're in a fog, and, and it's just hard to get a, a, a right perspective on what's happening and, and to kind of climb out of the midst of those circumstances. But here, God speaks from above. The God who's never disoriented, who is never confused, who knows the end from the beginning, and more than that, who plans the end from the beginning, and who always accomplishes his perfect will. That's the God who speaks to us this morning. So, so part of my prayer this morning is that his word, for, for some of you, and, and if you're not in the midst of it right now, you will be at some point, that his clear word would cut through just some of the fog that suffering can bring into your life. So, so what does God have to say? Why does he allow his people to suffer? I want to look at Peter's teaching here under three main headings this morning. The grief of trials, the purpose of trials, and then joy in the midst of trials. The grief of trials, the purpose of trials, and then joy in the midst of trials. So first, the grief of trials. This may seem almost too obvious of a thing to note here, but, but I actually think it's a really important point. Peter affirms that trials do bring real grief into our lives. Look there at verse 6. Peter begins... In this you rejoice. Now, I take the this there, the beginning of verse 6, to refer back to everything that he's just stated in verses 3 to 5. So the mercy of God causing us to be born again to this true and lasting eternal hope. We have this eternal inheritance that's given to us. God is guarding us right now for that future inheritance. He does that by keeping us believing in him, trusting him, until we do eventually enter the fullness of that salvation. 
And that whole reality of what God has done, what God is doing, what God will do for everyone who has been united with Jesus Christ by faith, we rejoice in that, though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So, so Peter affirms the, the reality of the believer's joy. We're going to come back to that. But he also acknowledges here there's something else that's going on in this life that, that does, in a sense, stand in contrast to that joy, namely grief through trial. He's going he's gonna to limit the nature of that grief and those trials in some very important ways, but we can't skip over the fact that he does affirm the reality of that grief. I don't think he limits it in such a way that he intends for us to just dismiss it or to treat it lightly or to disregard it. He, he's affirming the genuineness of that grief. You know, those who delight in having a big God who's in control of all things. And I get the sense that that's the, the truth here. I actually hope that's true for, he, for you, that you delight in a big God who is in control of all things. For those of us who delight in that, one of the things that we do need to be aware of is the potential, I think, temptation that we would just unhelpfully glide over the reality of the grief that's real in this life. We can just sort of want to skip over that and get to the good part that's coming, and, and it's incredibly important that we do get there. But as we try to keep our eyes on that final destination, and, and as we try to get the big picture perspective on our trials, the scriptures don't just glide over the reality of our grief, of our sorrow, of our pain. If you've ever read the Psalms, you know this is true. Listen to Psalm 6, verses 6 and 7. I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Or here's Psalm 38. I'm utterly bowed down and prostrate. All the day I go about mourning. I'm feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. My heart throbs. My strength fails me. And the light of my eyes, it has also gone from me. You know who wrote those words? King David who's described as a man after God's own heart. Philippians chapter 2. The apostle Paul speaks simply about the possibility that his friend and his partner in ministry, Epaphroditus, was, would have died. He was very sick. He was near death. And, and Paul was contemplating this possibility that, that Epaphras could have died. And you know what he says it would have done if, if Epaphras had died? It would have brought him sorrow upon sorrow. Or think of Jesus himself. Matthew 26, 38. Jesus is in the garden. He's anticipating the trial and the suffering of the cross, which was about to come. And what does he say? My soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. So Peter, I think in keeping with the rest of the scriptures, he affirms the reality of grief and suffering in this life. I think that's important for us to acknowledge and recognize for ourselves. You know, just another practical application here as you are thinking about moving into the lives of those around you who are dealing with grief and suffering, maybe someone who's, who's sick, someone who's lost a loved one, so, or just, just facing discouragement in some way, I think texts like this show us that at least part of what we can say is simply affirm the reality of their suffering, affirm the reality of their grief. I don't think that's all we say, 
But if we never say that, or if we just pass over that too quickly, I think it can actually take away from the power of God's word to then really address that grief for what it is. Peter affirms the reality of grief. He also tells us, you know, that grief, it can come through just all variety of trials that we face in this life. We're grieved by various trials, he says. And, you know, in terms of the context of Peter's letter, this is one of the statements that makes me think, I don't think the situation for Peter's readers, there's some debate about this, I don't think the, the situation was that they were facing this major official organized persecution, at least at that time. I don't think that's true. I think Peter just knows that when Christians live under pagan governments and work for unjust employers and live with family members and neighbors who don't know and, and follow the Lord in a world where we ourselves still struggle with our own sin, right? where Satan is prowling around with the hopes of destroying our faith in a world with sickness and death, Peter knows, he just knows, it's going to be hard sometimes. It's going to be hard sometimes. This is going to be the reality of every Christian's experience to one degree or another. We are going to face trials. Now, Peter puts some limitations on these griefs and these trials. He says, for a little while... If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So these trials are going to be brief. They're only going to last a little while, by which, of course, he means your entire life. <laughs> That's what he means when he says these, these trials, they're going to be brief. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that any particular trial that you are facing is going to last your entire life, but every Christian will endure trials for a lifetime, but only a lifetime. So be encouraged. 60 years, 70 years, maybe 80 years if you hold on for that long. And then, for those who are in Christ, all trial ceases forever. Amen. When these present struggles are then held up against our eternal hope, Peter says, they are but a breath. They're a mist. They're a vapor that will be here and then gone in a moment. They're brief. Here's how the Apostle Paul puts it when he describes the suffering of this life. Similar way, this light momentary affliction by which he means the worst trials you could possibly face for the duration of your life. This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. You've been grieved by various trials, but only for a little while, only in this life. Peter also says we will experience these trials if necessary, by which, of course, he means they are necessary. <laughs> he, he states it conditionally here, but, but clearly he's assuming the reality of the condition for every Christian. So, so this is not just for a few sort of select elite special command believers who, are, who, who have entered into like the advanced trial program. This is for every Christian, which then takes up our next point. We, we've seen that this, the grief of trials, we've seen that the grief is real, it can be heavy, it can come in all variety of forms. It's limited to this life. This is a reality for all Christians. Now, we still need to ask, though, why? Why does God do it this way? Why are trials necessary? What purpose does the Lord have in them? Verse 7, you've been grieved by various trials so that, okay, here's the purpose, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, 
that perishes though it's tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, so where does the necessity of our trials come from? Well, at this point, Peter does not appeal to the sinfulness of other people, although that's a reality. He doesn't appeal to the general curse of God that has come upon a fallen world, a world that has entered rebellion against him. He does not mention here the opposition of Satan, although later in his letter he will, and he'll give due weight to the reality of Satan's desire to destroy our faith. But here he speaks of the necessity that comes from the purpose of God in the life of a Christian. So our trials, all those other things are true, but there's something else going on. Our trials are necessary because God has a particular purpose for them. And what is God's purpose? It is to test and to prove and to strengthen the reality of your faith. That is God's purpose to test and to prove and to strengthen our trust, our dependence, our reliance, not upon ourselves, but upon God. And faith is shown, it's, it's demonstrated to be real, and faith is strengthened when it when it endures, when it comes up against trial and it doesn't disappear or fall away, but it keeps going, it continues forward. And God cares so much about your faith being in him and it being real and it being strong so that you don't look to the fleeting things of this world that he is willing to put you through trial in order to accomplish that. Why? Because he knows there is nothing more valuable in this world, nothing more important in this world than that you have genuine faith in him. Nothing more important than that. That's why Peter describes this faith as more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire. I think Peter makes this comparison of our faith to gold actually for two reasons. One, gold is incredibly valuable. So, so Peter, he, he lifts up gold here as this, this earthly representative of one of the most valuable things that you could attain in this life. Gold, gold is a symbol. It's a picture of that. If you don't deal in precious metals and that doesn't sort of just immediately connect with you, then, then think here of just anything in this life that is particularly precious or valuable to you. Maybe your house or your car, your job, your business, your money, your clothes, the food that you enjoy, your leisure, your vacations, your reputation, you name it. All of these things of great earthly value, none of them wrong in and of themselves, but they are temporary. They are passing away. They are perishing. And therefore, in and of themselves, they are extremely limited in what they can provide for you. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he forfeits his soul? But faith in Christ leads to eternal joy and therefore is of infinite value. Your faith is more precious than gold or anything else in this life which perishes. But I think Peter also mentions gold because gold has this unique characteristic about it. It becomes purer and more valuable when it's tested by fire. Now, there's an irony here, right? Fire is something that when it meets most things in this life, it brings destruction. And and I think for us, when we think about trials, that may be how we think of it. When we face suffering or we face trial, we think 
what this is going to do is it's going to bring destruction. But when fire meets genuine gold, you know what happens? It's made more pure. It's made more valuable. And this is exactly how it works when trials meet genuine faith. When trials meet genuine faith, faith is not destroyed. It is refined. It's strengthened and clarified and proven and demonstrated to be the precious reality that it actually is. Doesn't mean those trials aren't painful. It doesn't mean those trials are not difficult, but it does mean they serve a very good purpose in our lives. So God has a purpose for the trials in this life. They are to test and to strengthen and to prove the reality of our faith and to show its unique value in the world as it leads us to everlasting joy. But it gets even better. Peter says, God's purpose is that the tested genuineness of your faith, look there, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, whose praise and glory and honor is Peter talking about in verse 7? There's some debate about this. Uh, so my church's mission statement, Clifton Baptist Church, our, our mission statement declares that we exist to proclaim Jesus Christ so that People are transformed and God is exalted. So, so we want everything we do to lead to the glory of God, the exaltation and honor of God, which might be one of the reasons whenever I read these verses for, for, for many years, my default was to think Peter's obviously referring to the praise and the glory and the honor of God in Christ. And let me be very clear, it is so true that when the genuineness of your faith is demonstrated through trial, it brings great glory to Jesus. And on the day of his return, he will be honored by that because you've, you've held fast to him, you've, you've proven his trustworthiness as, you, as you've continued to trust him. That is true. Romans eleven thirty six. for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. When all is said and done, even our faith will be shown to be from him and through him and to him and for his glory. However, that supreme fact doesn't cancel out the truth that our faith, for which we are responsible, when it endures and it's proven through trial and testing and, and we keep honoring God by trusting him through that, you know what the Lord is going to do on that last day? He's going to turn around upon his return and he is going to bestow upon everyone who holds fast in that way praise and glory and honor. I think that's what Peter's talking about here. Let me tell you one of the reasons why I think that. If you have your Bible, look over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. Behold, the Lord says, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So, so on that day when Jesus return, returns, you, you hold fast to him, you know what's going to happen. You're not going to be put to shame for that. You know what you're gonna, what's going to happen, verse 7. So the honor, same word in our text this morning, the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. There's going to be shame. But for you, there will be honor. Or, or here's a similar statement, the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light 
the things now hidden in darkness and disclose the purposes of the heart. And what's going to happen then? Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Literally, his praise from God. That's, that should blow your mind. When you think about the reality of your own sin and weakness and frailty and how undeserving you are of heaven, and the Lord says, you hold fast to me and you will be commended on the last day. Just one more, Romans 2, 6 to 8. He will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience in well-doing, so you're patiently holding fast to the Lord, you're following him, seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Now, when we receive those crowns, having held fast to Christ and to his grace, what are we going to do? We're going to cast them right back down at his feet and say, apart from you, Lord, I could never have held fast. In fact, this is what my faith declares, is that you are worthy. We're going to cast them right back down at his feet. But you know what? That doesn't make those crowns meaningless, that you will receive that crown on that day. Here's another way to say it that, that might be helpful to you. The tested genuineness of your faith, it's not just precious to you. It's precious in the eyes of your God. He does not look lightly upon the fact that you keep holding fast to him in the midst of trial. When you trust him like that, it's precious to him because it brings great honor to him. And, and here's what this means then about our sufferings. This brings amazing purpose and opportunity to every trial that we might face in this life. From, from you know, that smallest daily nagging thing that you just deal with and you're like, ah, it's just so frustrating to me. From that little nagging thing to, to the biggest, unexpected, life-altering tragedy that you might face. In every case, this is what the Lord ultimately seeks from you, that you would trust him. That you would trust him for the fulfillment of his eternal promises to you in Jesus Christ and that you would keep living your life today in light of the reality of that eternal hope. Which is part of the reason then why we can actually have genuine joy in the midst of our trials. So point one was the grief of trials. That grief is real. Point two is the purpose of our trials. They are to test and to prove and to strengthen the reality of our faith. And as much as I like parallelism, I really like my points to be parallel, I couldn't call point three the joy of trials. Point three is, is joy in the midst of trials, because trials in themselves are not joyful. They're grievous. That's what makes them trials. So, so we don't delight in our trials just for their own sake. Christianity is not like some Eastern religions that, that would want to try to sort of elevate your state of mind where, where there's no more distinction between pleasure and between pain, that is not elevating your state of mind. That is to be taken for a fool. If someone convinces you that a day in the hospital with pneumonia is just as good with dinner as dinner with family and friends, you've been tricked. You've been duped. An evening in a prisoner of war camp is not better than a day at the beach. 
It's just true. We know this by experience, and, and the Word of God affirms the reality of our experience. Our experience. So, so the, the Bible doesn't glorify trials as being a wonderful thing in and of themselves, but it, what it does do is it, it puts our trials in a larger framework. It helps us locate them within a bigger story so that so that we see they have a meaning and a purpose which is beyond themselves, so that even though there's real pain and there's real grief that we experience, it's nevertheless mixed with this invincible, abiding, and supreme joy that we can have by knowing faith in Christ and the hope that He has given us. Verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, speaking of Christ, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Don't forget, these are the same people who he said, you're being grieved by various trials. Although, of course, the, the apostle Peter had seen Jesus with his own eyes. He, he spent three years with Jesus on the earth during his earthly ministry. These Christians that, that Peter was writing to, they had never seen Jesus physically, just as you and I have never seen Jesus physically. They came to know Jesus how? Through the testimony of those who had seen him. Peter knew they would not be seeing Jesus physically at that time because Jesus had ascended to the Father even as he is right now at the right hand of the Father ruling over all the earth. And yet, Peter says, they love him. They hadn't seen him, but they love him. They believe in him. How does that happen? How do you love and believe in someone that you've never seen. Well, you know, the Bible talks about a seeing, a beholding of Jesus with the eyes of our hearts. And how does that happen? It happens through hearing the truth of the gospel. We see Jesus with the eyes of our hearts by hearing the truth of the gospel. So the person of Jesus, who he is, what he's done, that is made known to us through the word, the, the proclamation of the gospel. And then through that, God opens our eyes to see him, to know him for who he really is. This is, I think, what's described in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, even though we don't see him physically. I think in, in his own way, basically, Peter is affirming that same reality. We know and we love and we trust Jesus for who he really is, even though we haven't seen him physically with our own eyes, I think that's what faith is. That's faith. You know, when Jesus had risen from the dead and he stood before Thomas, right, one of his disciples, and Thomas said, I'm not gonna believe unless I, I touch you. And, and Jesus said, Thomas, come here. Put your fingers right here in the hole, physical hole in my hand. Take your hand, put it right here, physical hole in my side where I was speared when I was dying for you on the cross. And, and Thomas touched him and, and saw him. And what did Thomas declare? My Lord and my God. He, he recognized Jesus for who he really is. But then what does Jesus say? Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you and that's me here today. That's who Jesus was talking about. The blessing that is given to us when we trust Jesus for who he is, when we see him for who he really is, 
through the gospel. That's why I'm so thankful for the faithful proclamation of the gospel that happens week after week here in this church. That blessing is held out for us today. Maybe you're here this morning and you think, I've never seen Jesus like that. That blessing is held out to you today. The gospel declares that Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, entered this world, this life that you and I are experiencing. And he, unlike you and I, who, who have failed to live and obey the Lord the way we should, he lived the perfect life, perfect righteousness. But not just that, Jesus went to the cross. He was crucified, a horrific death, executed as a criminal. But it wasn't just the physical death he died. The Bible tells us when he was dying, he was taking upon himself the very wrath of God that is deserved by sinners. And the Bible said, says he, does, he didn't just do that for himself, he did that for all who would trust in him. And as we trust in him, the Lord forgives our sins and gives us a righteousness that we can't provide ourselves. And we're reconciled to God. And all of the eternal promises of God are then given to us in Christ. That's the gospel. And when we personally come to know Jesus and, and we trust him for what he has done for us, we turn from our sin, we turn to Christ, we recognize him as the Lord and the Savior of our lives, we are promised that eternal inheritance, that he is one for us, and God's wrath is removed, and our sins are forgiven, and God's spirit lives within us to cause us then to be transformed, to live in the way that pleases God. And as our hope become set on that salvation, the joy of that future hope, it breaks in to this present reality and it overwhelms any grief that you or I may experience through the trials of this life. So while that grief is real, it's temporary, it has a good purpose, and it's mixed with a much greater an abiding joy that one day is going to swallow up grief completely. One of my present day heroes of the faith is Johnny Erickson Tata. If, you, if you've never heard of Johnny, you should look her up. She has so many wonderful things to say. Johnny has been paralyzed from the neck down since 1967. Took a dive into shallow water. She broke her neck paralyzed from the neck down, neck down since 1967. This past summer, she celebrated 52 years since her accident, and that's her word. She celebrated 52 years since that accident. In addition to being paralyzed, she's survived cancer. She has experienced the reality of chronic pain. And a few years ago, she gave an interview with World Magazine, and she just described a little bit of her experience. And here's what she said. It's so hard living with quadriplegia. That's when you're paralyzed, you can't arms and legs, and pushing 65 years old. Now, now she's 70, so this was a few years ago. When I wake up in the morning, my eyes are still closed. My head is on the pillow. And I can hear my friend in the kitchen running water for coffee. I know she's going to come into the bedroom in a moment. She's going to give me a bed bath, do my toileting routines, exercise my legs, strap on my corset, pull up my slacks, put on my blouse, sling me into a wheelchair. Then she will push me to the bathroom, brush my teeth, brush my hair, and blow my nose. I haven't even opened my eyes yet, and I am exhausted. And I'm thinking, I have no strength for this. God, I'm so tired of being a quadriplegic. I'm so tired of this. I have no ability to do this today. But I can do all things through you if you strengthen me. 
That's been something of her daily experience for 52 years. So in light of that, I want you to hear what Johnny said this past July on the 52nd anniversary of her accident. And I think it's a remarkable commentary on these verses. She says this, you know, outwardly I'm wasting away, but inwardly I'm being renewed day by day. My body may be unraveling, but my spirit, my measure of faith, my assurance of salvation, my sensitivity to sin, my confidence in the word of God, my hope of heaven, my compassion for others, my love of Jesus, everything about my spirit is growing. Deep, great trials bring with them deep grace from God, all of which enlarges our soul's capacity for Jesus. Brothers and sisters in Christ, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray. So Lord, we pray now that you would do within us what we cannot do in and of ourselves. We pray that by your grace, you would grant us faith. And I do pray, again, for, for any who may be here this morning who don't know the joy and the hope of knowing Christ, would you open the eyes of their hearts to see Jesus for who he really is and to trust him for forgiveness and salvation and the hope of eternal life. And for those of us who are trusting in you, Lord, would you sustain that faith in the midst of trial? Would you demonstrate the reality of it? Would you strengthen it so that we would hold fast to you until that day? We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.